the moment, over 60% of the people who wear sports shoes in the United States of America wear Reeboks. That's a lot of shoes. And it's getting that way here in Europe. But today we're talking about the company here in Bolton and its growth. And a little bit of imagination. It takes imagination to build such a worldwide company from the small beginnings when Mr. J.W. Foster in 1895, here in Bolton, made his first pair of running shoes. Time, just tell me all about your granddad, Joseph Foster, who started the Reebok company. The grandfather himself was a, a runner, part of Bolton Primrose Harriers. And they became Bolton United Harriers when they joined up with, I think it was just Bolton Harriers or something, so they became Bolton United Harriers. But he, he was not a very good runner. Well, in those days, of course, uh, running was something very new. It was coming on the scene, and it was only the elite who could really run. And so uh, one or two people made themselves spike running shoes, got Bolton manufactured a little cobbler just to put them together. Uh, grandfather was a bit sort of innovative and thought he would have a go at this. It seemed like a good idea, so he made himself a pair of shoes. And I'm sure you've heard the story that he sold, he had hand sewn one together and nailed the other one together because he couldn't wait. Uh, <clears throat> but the shoes were very successful. Delighted. Went out, found he could run very nice. Then all his all this friends, all his people at the Bolton Harriers all said, well, we like a pair of these shoes. The next thing we find is he developed a business. And that business really developed very special because running, not a big sport, you know, soccer even in those days was much bigger. So he developed this nice running company and from there on, even though it was small, he delivered shoes all over the world. And it, in 1904, we got our first world record with Alf Shrub. As far back as that, and that happened in Glasgow, where we got three world records in one day. From then on, world records galore came on. But the problem is, he didn't grow. And really it came until after the Second World War, before the growth came. We we're on the third generation. So grandfather had done his business. His sons had developed quite a bit, but it really came up to myself and my brother, where we looked around and we said, this should be a big business. Grandfather, he, uh, I think, well, they were all, it was okay whilst Grandfather was alive, but Grandfather died quite young. He died when he was 15, in fact he died uh, in 1933, about, I think it's November. But he died, and I was born in 35, in May, 18 months later, uh, on his birthday. So I was born on the 18th of May and he, he'd been born on the 18th of May, so that's why they call me Joseph William Foster. I got his name. The old, um, it's probably a key off the line that, probably in the factory. In some factories you actually had to, um, you had to go and get the key and you had a tag number so they made sure that the equipment was returned. That's maybe what that is. I'll take that. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, Foster's. Oh, right. it's probably get lost. It's so yeah, little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take it. It's probably what it is. Yeah. They used to make you have your tag and the key so yeah. if you borrowed a piece of equipment. Yeah, make well, sure. I don't, you know, I don't think the factory were that big. Was it that big? No. Oh gosh, no. I think the most that ever worked there were about when we moved to uh, uh, Radcliffe at Bradley Fold, and I think there was probably about. 40 people, oh, but, uh, yeah, but that was yeah. probably the biggest amount, yeah. I think they were very, very So I think it went down to like three, four people at one stage. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my name's Paul Smith, uh, I've been working for Reebok for 14 years in various different countries now. Um, I originally hailed from uh, Stockport and it was always my ambition to work for Reebok. Um, and today we're going through the archive here in a warehouse and it's turned up some uh, amazing finds. Um, I'm actually design manager for Reebok Classic, um, so I focus on lifestyle. Basically Reebok started off in, in Bolton. Mm -hmm. It was a Bolton company uh, 
I started working for them in 1983. Uh, so it's so next, I know, but so next year it'll be sort of my 30th anniversary with Reebok. Uh, I did leave for a while and then came back to the brand, but it was quite a, at the time, a, a, you know, sort of a huge uh, boost for the town of Bolton that we had such an international well-known brand working you know based based in the town well we grew in America but we never took our eyes away from Bolton we knew where the big market was but we wanted to say no this is our home Bolton is where we started grandfather started this in 1895 uh, I've lived here all my life I travel a lot but I've lived here all the people who have been responsible for building the rest of the world are here we said no we want to stay in Bolton and since we had such tremendous success why couldn't we not only stay here but build a nice new office and also see what we can do in Bolton to bring sport into Bolton at the right levels. They sponsored Bolton Wanderers Football Club and the stadium became known as the Reebok Stadium. So that also was you know, sort of worldwide mm -hmm. exposure and the fact that it was still you know, always been known as a, a local brand. Even when Adidas came to take over the Reebok brand, Adidas still kept the Bolton roots, roots going in the in the stadium, so we still have a connection with with Bolton. I was used to um, hang out at the local sports store and covet the latest pair of Reeboks coming in. Um, I've still got my original pair from 1987. So basically, the materials that you see here would form the upper so what would happen the templates would be placed on the material the material was cut out mm -hmm. and then marked and then this is a side stripe that would probably go where the, the markings are on the side and then everything was put on top of each other and was stitched together so you, you, you get that sort of shape then what happened was this would be put on a last that, which then forms the shoe mm -hmm. it would be placed on a machine that would pull it all round glue it at the bottom and then the sole unit was put on the top allowed to dry and then the, the last taken out so you get basically the finished, sort of finished article of the shoe, which is picture over there. Um, what sort of shoes was your grandfather making, and how do they differ from what you make today? Well, this is the sort of shoe that grandfather was making, and these used to be hand sewn. The whole construction was a turn shoe construction. That means they were made inside out. We can't do that. That one is sewn on afterwards. The whole shoe was made inside out, hand sewn, put together in beautiful calf leather all the best leathers were, were used to make it lightweight and this sole here which held the spikes this was just sewn together sewn on afterwards and that type of construction i should suggest went on for maybe 30 40 maybe even 50 years before that uh, gave way to modern materials modern materials being nylons injection molded soles where you can screw the sole, the, the spike in. That means you can change spikes from long to short, depending on the surface. And synthetic tracks, of course, had uh, quite a lot of influence on design. And that way you became lighter. They took on less moisture as well, which is another thing. The moisture in here, this is synthetic suede as well. So that when the moisture comes on, it sheds it. In this, unfortunately, as it got wet, it got more and more heavy. So you see the probably about 80 years of development. This is our latest spike shoe, the spike shoe that our top athletes would wear. <laughs> so this is uh, Dean Road and I'm pretty sure that the old JW Foster's factory, which from uh, the late 1800s, I'm pretty sure that it was on the site of the college. So there would have been old factory like buildings and factory buildings. But I'm, I'm quite certain that the, the JW Foster's building is just on the college, but we're certainly on Dean Road, which uh, the factory was on. Just looking at 
this. That's very early branding in there, I don't know if you can see that. It says JW Foster and Sons, embossed on the leather. Uh, these are Fosters. They yeah. see just about yeah, in there. Just, yeah. The embossed on the yeah. leather. My father and uncle took over the business, but uh, I think it's fairly well known, they didn't speak to each other. So we had two sides to the business. One was the hand sewn turn shoe, I don't know if you know what turn shoes are, but they, they make it inside out and they sew it together by hand, then they turn it the right way out. Um, and my father sort of developed machine sewn, so it was still made by hand, but instead of sewing it, they sewed it with a by hand, it was sold with a machine. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference. And they have their own sales book. And they, if they ever came together, it was only to cuss each other, tell each other something, whatever. In fact, my brother and myself, we had to pull them apart on one occasion. Which was like, come on, <laughs> we can't be doing this. But it's probably one of the reasons that the business didn't develop because there was no cohesion, there was nothing. Uh, and my uncle, he, he was fairly young when he died, I think he was 58 when he died. So my grandfather died at 54, I think, uncle boy was 58. Then my father took over the business. Fosters were making running shoes like this for athletes um, as early as 1895. And they were supplying uh, Olympic athletes soon after that. Um, it became known worldwide. Uh, there was even a size chart that we've just found and you could draw your foot around it and send it in and they would make the shoes and ship them back to you. Um, in actual fact, they opened an envelope um, in the 1940s and a snakeskin dropped out and there was just a note attached and it said here, make me a pair of shoes out of this. <laughs> they fulfilled the order and they sent the shoes. Well, today has been something of an introduction because it, we're celebrating the Reebok company that you can be proud of because kids all over the world are enjoying wearing Reeboks and you can say, yeah, but I live in the town where it all started. That's me, that's my brother, and we're actually put into studs. I was a photograph, so I'm sure we can find we one. Have. Uh, but uh, we were the uh, studying. Uh, it says football boots, but I say rugby boots, but uh, so, we, so we joined the company. Um, and then really that was it, because when I was 18, I went and did national service. My brother didn't do his until he was 21, so we were more or less doing it at the same time. We came out, and after maybe 18 months of, uh, of with the family, when you know your family's fighting and what can you do, it's like we decided it was time for us to go. Yeah. My brother had been in Germany and he knew all about Adidas. Look, oh, this company's doing this, this company's doing this, why aren't we doing? Um, so we actually left the parent company just before my uncle died and we set up Mercury Sports Footwear. Mm -hmm. And Mercury Sports Footwear, we were okay with that for about 18 months until our accountant said, you better register your name because this is what you've got to do. And we found out we couldn't register our name because somebody had it registered already. And that registration was offered to us for a thousand pounds, but in those days we didn't have five pounds or ten pounds or anything. And so the agent told me to just go and find another name. And, um, and uh, trying to find uh, uh, a word that wasn't already registered to somebody else and going through a dictionary and... I came across Reebok and it's only here in, uh, in Webster's Dictionary, which was a dictionary I won. You've seen the photograph of me running. I won the dictionary during the war. And why was it an American dictionary? I don't know what it was. I haven't got hold of this. Uh, and in the American dictionary, the, the spelling was R-W-B-O-K, which was rather sexy. Good. Looked excellent.
A Reebok is a small antelope that has survived very well in spite of the predators and unforgiving terrain of its home on the plains of Central Africa. An apt name for a company that's grown from its humble beginnings in a small Bolton factory to a place among the world leaders in its industry. If somebody comes to me and says, I want to make running shoes out of Reebok skin, I can't stop them saying this is, these are Reebok shoes. So we fought and fought for about 10 years, and eventually after 10 years, they did decide that really Reebok was a shoe, not an animal. <laughs> so we won that battle after about 10 years. You know, some of these are going back decades. Um, Reebok were um, always known for quality. The leather was quality, the fit was, the construction. Um, and it's just something you keep, you get attached to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You rolled it, you remember, and rolled I it saw up. that. You put it in your, your pocket, so if you were on a plane, you could take your shoes off and, and then take your shoes out of your pockets and, and put them. Put That's a long time shoes. ago. Uh, maybe about 10 years. If this was my size, I would tell you. Would you be, be off? I'd be off. This is the coolest thing ever. They're super heavy. Should I try? <laughs> I just want to fit. It's not <laughs> These shoes are for foul running. You can see the uh, the lugs are, are really big um, because you're going over huge terrains. You're coming down mountains with loose slate, and then you're going into the lowlands, Lancashire and Cumbria, where it's incredibly marshy and muddy. So uh, it's an incredibly grueling race. Um, foul running is the uh, is the Nordic name for it. And actually, the the earliest recorded uh, foul run was. Um, around 1000 um, by uh, I think it was King Malcolm of Scotland and he actually commissioned this race over mountains to find the swiftest messenger to take letters. And that was the time when we when we changed and we called ourselves Mercury Works in order to do that. In fact the interesting thing also about Foster's their, their, their works was called Olympic Works. Oh. Probably on that emblem. This is, is a, a yeah. logo like Olympic torches isn't there on the Something. Well, that, that reminds me now, I was like saying, you know, and we had our little mercury there, and we, we did this torch on Reebok. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that was one of our first ways of putting Reebok out as a trademark. And that was our first um, sort of side stripe way of doing things, and we actually got a complaint from Adidas to say that that was uh, the mark, and we said, well, it's not really, it's sort of two stripes and there's a T. Uh, but and everybody's advice is, well, look, that is a big company. Mm -hmm. Not much point in fighting them, not much point in arguing, just change it. <laughs> and we were, we were not a very big company in those days, so it was uh, not too, too much to change it to this one, which, oh, well, that's Jeff, that's my brother. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my brother died when he was, again, 40, he was 46. He actually died of stomach cancer. Shame, but, because uh, he didn't see us... Uh, really grow. We, we eventually ended up with the, uh, the this cross stripe here, which of course we see now that Ron Hill was wearing in the Boston Marathon. I think that's when he actually got clear. He got the record there, two hours, ten minutes and three seconds. Um, but who, who thought of these designs? Was that you and your brother? Or did you mainly, hire... mainly me. Yeah? I, yeah okay. I was mainly involved in all this. I had to sign all the papers to say that it was mine and whatever. Yeah. When, yeah. Uh, when eventually it was signed over to Paul uh, Fireman, well, to Pentland. To yeah. Pentland in its early days. That was what I was trying to explain before. And I did this. This was, um, <clears throat> if you look down on the shoe. The arrow actually came from the lateral medial pattern pieces yeah. from a plan view of the Vexa. We have these that is like looking down on the shoe. So I highlighted that, but didn't want it to be 
simply directional. She spun it around and then made this solid shape. So we had a star. He outlined the segments, but he kept the original two, which came from the vector. And that's where the star was going on. I never knew that. But again, one of our um, different logo, different styles, because we have changed the, the style of the, uh, the way we write uh, Reebok. And who, who? In fact, I see you've got the, the one that I eventually ended up with was that, which I like, but uh, obviously you can't. I think the second one from that was where they just made the K more, and that they are more sort of straight, a bit more aggression. Basically, in May 1983, uh, May June 83, the Reebok factory and the office up in Tottenham moved together into this building. Now, the, this first part of the building here was Reebok International. That was the offices. Then the second bit in the middle was the, the warehouse. And then the last bit over the other side was the factory. So you walk through it then. Uh... So the offices were all in there. Yeah. Sorry? Still a sticker on this Is there? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing a history project. I used to work in here, so. Yeah. You've got a sticker, haven't you? Yeah. Can, we, can we film the sticker? Yeah, yeah. So, thank you very much. Brilliant. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, 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 we were in this. Uh, See you later. This bit with the office. This shoot I've done since here. Um, it was a special makeup for an account. Did it absolutely huge. Uh, they were queuing around the block for this. <clears throat> but that probably wouldn't necessarily sell well in the UK, yeah. whereas yeah. in the UK something more along the, 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 mm -hmm. the lines of the men's leather tennis uh, would be a better seller because it's known as a classic, Reebok classic. Yeah. Or even vintage running like that, the super slim outsole, and that's a, that's a really beautiful flattering silhouette. You know, we could sell something like that today. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Flying out time, Jimmy Carter, yes Jimmy Carter. This, this also was meant to be, the guy who actually did this, I didn't do that one, the guy who did it said, well, this is like a shoe. That's the heel and that's the front of the shoe. So it, it did have a, you know, a look of that, but we soon changed from that. And yes, I did, I did meet Jimmy Carter, but he wasn't the president. He was a guy who uh, worked for Ford in, uh, I went to Philadelphia, Detroit. I guess that, uh, well, we talked about what we saw in those pictures, though, was it 1968 when I first went to America with the, um, to the National Sporting Goods uh, and SGA. Uh, and, I, and I went every year from then on. It used to be three years were in Chicago, and the fourth would be in um, Atlanta, Atlanta, which was like, you know, on, on the 6th of February, which was about the date I used to be out there. It was uh, how many times? I must have gone about six or seven times on, on my own. I had about five different people from various times who we sort of set up little bits of distributions. But uh, we, uh, 
We eventually, eventually sort of ended up with uh, Paul Fireman. Just to introduce Paul to you. If he wants to say a few words, he can do. If not, he's going to get up in this machine and lower the box down. <laughs> well, I'd certainly, uh, I'd rather be in the machine. I'm certainly not going in the box. <laughs> Took the bus and went up to see him at Boston Camping. And it was him, his brother, Steve, and another guy uh, who was his brother-in-law. We did do a deal at the end with Paul, I think I went back a couple of times, and Boston Camping just, they just dissolved him. Paul became Reebok USA. His, his brother started making snap wallets, I don't know if you remember those, they sort of using um, Velcro, mm -hmm. so the fabrics and come together well. He started making, and, and he was doing quite well. It was Paul who was suffering at the time. We market Reebok as an international brand. Uh, it just turned out that America is where the uh, velocity of sales took place at first. But we're actually doing well all over the world now, and uh, we expect in the United Kingdom that we'll continue to market with that same international flavor. People generally in this area have been very nice to us over the years, and we're thrilled to be back here. We think it'll be excellent for uh, the economy here, as well as, of course, for the company. But anyway, as, uh, as things turned out, Paul eventually uh, you know, got the right shoes, got the right thing, uh, and started the business going. Bumped into Arnold Martinez, who by that time, he was in California, he was one of the uh, technical salesmen, so he was a technical salesman, and he sort of said, why don't we try making aerobics? But it was Arnold Martinez who said, no, we've got to make that to glove leather, because glove leather is beautiful, soft, nice, and... Uh, <sighs> And when they asked me about it, I said, no, you can't make shoes out of glove leather. It doesn't work because you can rip it. You can rip it. It's a piece of paper, so you can rip it. You can't do that. Okay, then. So what do we do? They, they lined it with nylon. So they, uh, mm. I said, well, okay, so you put nylon to it. That's fine. But now this is leather. It's supposed to breathe. So what did they do? They punched holes in. <laughs> so, and if you see, I don't know, kind of the... Uh, well, the print, it was actually the, uh, this the freestyle. Do you know the story about the leather? How the story goes with the leather? I don't even know if that's true, actually, but it's the, it's the, it's the story uh, which, which we know is that the garment leather was used by mistake um, and the shoes were made up in this beautiful soft leather and sent over to the US, um, but there wasn't time to remake the shoes, so they showed them anyway um, and everyone fell in love with it. The only thing that went wrong with it is that you try and stick a sole onto that and it's so thin that they used to break around the, the edge of the welt. Mm. They used to come away. Had we been doing that in the UK, we would have been dead. In America, they didn't care. They just bought another pair. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what drove those sales from 39 million that we saw to 170 something million in, in successive years. And then I think it went to 300 million and then 900 million. So in about four, five years, you've gone from merely well less than 30 million up, up to a, a billion which was an incredible story so that's when this perception and certainly in America well, I, I think in, in as far as the street is concerned and as far as people looking at shops are concerned they look at Reebok uh, as being aerobics yeah. and, and I think that uh, and it, it's something they, they sort of had a problem with for a long time because you, you get to a point and let's say well women are very fittle you know this is this is not going to be something that's going to last forever women are, you know they're going to dump us like you know and how do we move from here to here um, so you know whilst the men wanted a piece of the action of these nice Reebok shoes we were not really becoming male but lifestyle we tried to do lifestyle and yet identifying lifestyle is difficult. It's very difficult to, because you're almost identifying fashion. Uh, and if you can do that, well, to do that, you need really good people. Let's do something. So we thought of this time capsule, which is full of lots of goodies, I believe, of everything that's happened in the uh, in the company from the days when, my ball, 
when, uh, when Foster's began in 1895, right up to present day. And we're thrilled that Paul should be here because as our president and chief executive, he's the man that's led the team, that really has seen this fabulous, fabulous growth of Reebok from five years ago being quite insignificant to today being virtually number one in the world. We're certainly number one in America. And now we're coming on probably number two in the world, which is pretty good in five years. And the reason they were able to get that growth, because you gotta get people to manufacture those. Yeah. And the reason they were able to do that is because Nike took a dip. And one of the factories in Korea, which is a big factory, said, oh, well, we'll do, we'll do your shoes. And so they were able to do that because Nike took a dip and Reebok took the production. <laughs> you primarily Paul Fireman, who everybody knows, um, who got the U.S. licensing rights in 1979 and then grew the business uh, in a way that was unimaginable uh, uh, ten years later. Uh, Angel Martinez, who was, not sure what his title was then, but became the chief marketing officer and a very key shareholder, uh, but together they, of course, developed the, the Prince's Shoe, the famous you know, aerobic glove leather shoe that uh, became uh, not just a sports and aerobic hit, but uh, a huge fashion uh, item around the world and really established Reebok, which in the 80s was much more a woman's brand than a man's brand. And I think one of Paul and Anil's gifts was to understand that there was a huge market for women's sports footwear. I don't think this smells too bad. <laughs> When we brought back um, the Franchise 5, we wanted to do vintage versions of them to make them look um, they, uh, like they were dead stock really and they just sat in a, in a box for years and they had that beautiful vintage quality so we did things like this where we chose the colour of the foam to actually be yellow. Uh, if you look at the little label on the back, there was a silk label uh, in its yellow colour back then and all these details were taken into consideration. We used cement that was yellow here. Um, back in the day it would have reacted with the sunlight and it would have gone yellow over time. Yeah, um, so we went to great lengths to recreate these. Yeah. Even the logos are distorted, the distance between the letters was taken into consideration. The flag is distorted, it's square, now you look at it, it's rectangular. These were all imperfections that the factory um, did back in their, those days and no one really paid too much attention, but now they give it that uh, old school quality. <laughs> they tried desperately hard to become more sort of uh, sports focused by uh, doing tennis and then they tried to do a bit of football and whatever but really the brand had grown on being a woman uh, a woman's shoe and almost created aerobics as a trend as well yeah. by sponsoring fitness trainers and uh, aerobic clubs and you know in every possible way uh, promoting exercise uh, for women and then moving into high performance as well, you know, in, in athletics. Um, later, uh, after I joined, really trying to move Reebok into uh, much more of a, a sports brand, uh, uh, more male-oriented, uh, moving into sponsorship of major federations like the Rus Russian Olympic Committee and all of the sports federations there. Um, going into professional football in the United States, um, basketball, yeah. uh, you know, moving into things like uh, the pump shoe and things like this, which uh, again were big marketing successes at the time, uh, but also, you know, really innovative. I mean, if you think of ladies' aerobic footwear was an innovation, the pump was innovation, uh, lots of other uh, ways to move technology into sports performance. Some of the athletes that do wear Reebok shoes around the world, I know um, that the one of the highest accolades of the NBA, the National Basketball Association, is to get um, endorsements, and you have some endorse endorsements from some of the, the bigger NBA teams, don't you? We do indeed. Uh, that's more the Americans' uh, area than mine, because they, of course, develop their categories. But certainly, uh, being a Boston company, we work very very well with Celtics and Danny Ainge is there, he's I think our number one player. But uh, we're new into things like basketball, we've only been in basketball for less than 12 months. 
who were already number two in America in basketball. And we sign new players, new teams, and we do all the endorsements we can. As a marketing company, we find that we, we must be performance. So we, we have a performance application for the product. To do that, you need to have these sort of sponsorships. Then we know that we're also fashion. And if we make our product so it looks good, as well as performs, it then becomes street, and that's where the numbers are. We're working on a project for Garb Store at the moment, and uh, the shoes are actually inside out. So you'll be able to see the pump ladders, you know, you'll be able to see features like the, uh, the arch bandage, things like this inside the shoe, all the support things, you know, if you look at competitors like Nike, um, the technology is in the outsole, but Reebok shoes always pay attention to the technology in the upper, and that will showcase really how much goes into a pair of Reeboks. And in 88 and 89, Reebok was the global market leader. So it was a brand which was exploding in all the right ways and uh, hiring uh, lots of exciting people and uh, you know growing uh, geographically and growing in terms of moving into sports marketing. Um, it uh, was in the 80s when I came in um, primarily a woman's brand based around fitness and aerobics, uh, very successful and one of the gifts of Paul Fireman and the management team in the United States was to recognize the potential of women's sport and women's footwear uh, in this area. So it was just a heady time, you know, we were, uh, for lack of a better term, we were sort of printing money. I mean, the, the business was hugely profitable um, and that meant there was a lot of money to spend on marketing and development. Sunday the 6th of December 1987 will go down in the civic history of Bolton in the north of England. The rich and the famous from all over the world converged on the peaceful town centre for its most memorable event of the year. The opening of Reebok International House by its president, one of Bolton's proudest sons, Joe Foster, together with his mother Bessie. Charlton Heston, one of the world's best loved actors, Veronica Hamill, beautiful star of Hill Street Blues, the mayor and mayoress of Bolton, 600 schoolchildren and England's Halle Orchestra all contributed to a sparkling day. So in December 1987, Reebok had International and the offices had outgrown uh, the place at Bradley Fold. Uh, so they, they'd been building this for about seven, eight months and uh, the offices was opened in December 87. And we stayed here until I think it was summer 1993 when Reebok International then moved to London. But these offices were purpose built and uh, every office was taken by staff. Well, you uh, do want to just go and throw poles in this, do you want to just go and see the three box across the gym? and see what Reeboks evolve bad shoes and actually evolve into, uh, into the crossfit. I can't have a crossfit, of course. And, and this basically is now the concept of Reebok because we're uh, seen as a fitness company. So this, this cross, Reebok crossfit turns everybody's dreams. And the workout can last from anything from five minutes to a, an half an hour workout and it's just exercise that it's just quick and intense. Uh, it's designed to get, it's cardiovascular, I think, it's just designed to get everything 
yeah. and working, but it's based on the whole concept of Reebok's uh, dedication to fitness. And even CrossFit can be taken back, right back to JW Foster's, because we were involved in athletics. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I need my box and I need the books. I can only do three. Can't oh. do any more. Well, You'd have to work hard and long to show the history of the company as being an athletic performance company. But it was. Uh, and we have the agreement there in America that these, there was that shoe and they were doing 500 pounds a month to Yale University. But Frank Ryan and Bob Shane Jack, I mean, they were the kings of Yale, the, the Olympic movement in, in America. And so they could sell them. In fact, when I used to go over and uh, to the NSGA shows, people used to come up to me and uh, because they, they, the salesmen had that connection. And one or two would come, I still have a pair of your father's shoes. And they would come and I still have a pair of in fact, we've got a friend in, in Sheffield. He's got, oh, he's got a pair. He's got a pair. <laughs> You've got a... He, was, he, was a, he was a three years athletic champion. He was a three years champion, yes. Yeah, and he's got a pair of the, what are they, with the lizard skin on the side or whatever they are. Uh, Those, the, the deluxe, yes. Yeah. yeah, from him. From way back. From way back. He brings them out to dinner when you have dinner party. He brings them out. It's not machines, it's not machines. That's what we heard from Rob that people are sending in their old uh, foster shoes. Mm. That's why we have them in the archive. I don't know if we can, if we, if we like to go there, mm -hmm. just to have yeah, an we, informal. Yes, we'll have a look at them. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of people don't know inside and outside Reebok um, how amazing the story is. And really, I think it's. Um, the greatest story in the athletics industry, um, and that deserves to be told. Lewis's boots. We have we have some Lewis's shoes. Yeah. 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 I was about fifteen, I think. My mum gave me the money to buy a pair of new Reebok football boots. But on the way to the sports shop, I decided to get a cheaper pair. So I could take a girl to the pitches. Jill Evans it was. She was gorgeous. I waited for ages. She never turned up. My relationship with Reebok has been brilliant. Obviously, I've been with them over 20 years, so you know we've had no problems. Um, obviously, the, the relationship's changed over the years, <clears throat> from being a 19-year-old who just wants to get the gear, wants to put on the trainers, wants to play in the boots, and, and that was about it, really. Um, to now, where and, and of course recently, where it's a partnership really regarding developing the boots um, when it comes to different colours. How they, how they feel and you know the weight of the boots these are all things that have developed over the years um, which you know we've, 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 we've done together and the way they look you know when I was 19 the majority of boots that footballers were, were playing would be black um, any white boots or red boots or yellow boots would be it would be so alien at that time but now of course playing in black boots would, would be the same it would be strange because hardly anyone plays in black boots uh, Different colours, different um, different colours each season, and that's been a, a massive change. Of course, materials change. You try and get the boot as light as you can. You try and get um, the boots as comfortable as you can. So they're probably the major changes that have happened over the years. Yeah, this is a collection of uh, some of the boots that I've worn over the years. Um, obviously, I've been with Reebok a long time, so there's a lot of boots. These these were quite special because these were the boots that I wore during the 99 season that United won the treble. So these are the actual boots that I wore in the Champions League final where we, we beat Bayern Munich 2-1. These gold ones which um, this was to mark 900 games for United. So we did a limited edition of 11. This is 3 of 11. Um, obviously 11 being my Man United number. So. Um, that was to mark my 900th appearance for United. 
Also these ones, these were I think 95, 96 where I believe they were one of the best selling boots, if not the best selling boots that year. I sold a lot of boots for Reebok this year. <laughs> and more recently, this is um, the Olympic boot which I wore in the Olympics. Uh, which again, limited edition of 11, this is 7 of 11, with the GB colours and um, again limited edition and you know quite special boots to me. So they're just some of the boots that I've worn over the years. And I think that is it. And, and I, to me the athletics business, this football, it, it's, it's a passionate business. There's good passion in there, and it's it's been really good fun, and it has to be fun, and that's it. that was what Reebok was like. But you grow out of that. That's the problem. You grow through it, and yeah. things happen, and it, it's not the same. So it's very tough, I think, for anybody to run a company mm -hmm. and keep that right image, keep it going right. It very is difficult, and uh, um, I think. <laughs> You've got to keep changing it to keep that spirit.